Hi, thanks for joining us for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Not all bugs are bad. In fact, beneficial bugs can take care of some infestations before they are even a problem. Also quick, five ounces per acre is how much on your 50 square foot bean patch. Today we'll show you how to do garden math. That's just ahead on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Tanya Ashworth. Tanya is our local garden expert, and Mr. D is here. Thanks for joining us. Howdy. Thanks for having me. No problem. All right, Tanya, let's talk a little bit about beneficial bugs. But first, what do we mean by beneficial? Well, a beneficial bug or beneficial insect is a, a bug that helps you reach your goals in the garden. Mm -hmm. Some of them are pollinators. We think of immediately our, our bees that are good pollinators, so they're beneficial to us. And also we have a lot of bugs that kill other bugs that we don't like. Okay. So um, we have bugs that eat the bugs that would eat our vegetables. Okay, so you wanna start with the braconid wasp? Sure, right. um, the braconid wasp is very a common thing to be seen in the garden, but most people don't know when they've seen uh, evidence of the mm -hmm. bracketed wasp. Usually you'll find these on tom tomato hornworms sure. on your tomato plants. You'll see all these little white egg sacs mm -hmm. on the back of the caterpillar and the bracketed wasp, even though it's a wasp, it will not sting you. They're very tiny, like a, an eighth of an inch, so very small. The female lays her eggs on the back of caterpillars, mm -hmm. moths, um, beetle larvae, and some aphids. And when those eggs hatch, the larvae eat the host, the tomato hornworm or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then um, after they are done eating, the bad bug dies and the <laughs> beneficial, the new beneficials fly away to infect more of your pests. So if you see a tom tomato hornworm that has all of these little white egg sacs on the back. You don't want to mm -hmm. squish it. Um, you want to leave it there so that it can um, provide food for those good bugs. You can also attract them in your garden by growing certain things like dill, parsley, okay. wild carrot, and yarrow. Um, in general, any kind of little, a little herb with small flowers, uh, those the adult wasps like to use for nectar. Wow, small flowers. I think that's pretty interesting. Uh-huh. Okay. Now let's talk uh, about green lacewing. Okay, the green lacewing, um, the larvae are the ones that feed on the pests in this okay. case. They like aphids, mealybugs, caterpillars, scales, thrip, and white flies. So a, a lot, lot of the things yeah. that we yeah. don't like, they like to munch on. Yeah. The female will lay her eggs on a slender egg stalk and she can lay about 200 eggs at a time on, yeah. these, on these stalks. And one larva that emerges from that will eat 200 aphids in a week. So they're called aphid lines. They're really hungry, <laughs> hungry guys. In a week? In a week, 200 oh, aphids. And Amazing. they will feed for two to three weeks before they go into a cocoon and then five days later they emerge. Okay. Um, you can plant some things to attract them to your garden like Angelica, Coreopsis, Cosmos, and Sweet Alyssum. And you can also mail order those egg stalks with the, the eggs. Okay. Um, so yeah, the green lacewing uh, are very beneficial. You don't want to, you don't want to spray those with an insecticide. And in fact, um, a good rule of thumb is, you know, when you spray an insecticide, you oftentimes kill the beneficials with the ones that you're trying to get rid of. Good so, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So um, unless you use BT because it's specific to caterpillars, but sure. if you use a broad spectrum insecticide, you're gonna kill all of your good with your bad. So you want to be careful in how you use those. Good information to share, Tanya. Good information. How about this next one though, a pirate bug? Yes, How about that? minute pirate bugs. Yeah. Kind of a fun name. Yeah, it's pretty um, fun. They're very small, uh, a twelfth to a fifth of an inch long. That's where they get the minute from. Yeah, very small. small, and they're black and white in color. The immature stages are um, very small. They're kind of teardrop shaped and brown and orangey colored. The adults and the nymphs will both. Um, be predators for thrips, spider mites, aphids, and their eggs. Mm. And an adult will eat 30 spider mites a day. 
So um, they're quick moving. They'll attack just about anything though, not just those particular pests that we like to get rid of. And the way they um, attack their prey is they have a piercing sucking mouth part. Mm -hmm. So they'll use that mouth part to inject into their prey and then they will suck the juices out of the prey. Yee. Yuck, but that's how <laughs> they do it. Um, they can go from an egg to adult in three weeks and they have three generations per season. And this is another one that you can buy online. Okay. Um, and they're actually a really good uh, predatory bug if you've got a greenhouse and they may be more effective than, than others. And if you want to try to just encourage them to come to your garden, you can plant goldenrod, daisies, mm -hmm. um, alfalfa, yarrow, mm -hmm. clover, and vetch. Okay. All right. So how about this next group of beneficial bugs? Spiders? Spiders, really? Spiders? yes. Well, they're not technically an insect. We talk uh -huh. about beneficial insects. Uh -huh. They're not technically an insect because they have eight legs instead of six. So okay. they're an arachnid. Um, but not all spiders build a web to, mm -hmm. to catch their prey. In fact, the ones in our garden that are beneficial, they hunt their prey. So we have uh, wolf spiders, yes. jumping spiders, and crab spiders. And the wolf spiders, I know every gardener has seen, they mm -hmm. live along in the leaf litter and the mulch. And whenever you're turning your garden over mm -hmm. or doing any kind of weed, and you'll find them there. They're kind of the large brown spiders with the stripes on their backs. Yeah, large. Yes. Yes, yes they are. <laughs> and they carry yeah. around, the mama spider carries around her eggs with her where she goes. And after her young emerge for two weeks, she'll carry her young on her back. Mm -hmm. And they um, hunt at night in the leaf litter. Um, then we have the jumping spider. <laughs> the jumping spider, even though they don't use a web, they'll use a strand of silk to tether themselves mm -hmm. to a leaf, and then they'll jump on and attack their prey. And then the crab spiders <laughs> have a lot uh, enlarged front front legs, yeah. and that's where they get the name crab spider from. Right. And they like to hang out on flowers and hunt for their prey from flower petals. And they can even turn colors, change colors a little bit to camouflage against the flowers. Oh, oh, oh. how about that? Yeah, not pretty fair. cool. Yeah, pretty yeah not fair. Not fair. <laughs> <laughs> They're good yeah, hunters. Pretty good. All right, so how about the praying mantis? We've all heard about the yeah. praying mantis. Well, the praying mantis are really cool they looking bugs. Cool. Um, of course, they get their names from their big front legs mm -hmm. that they use to grab their prey while they munch. And they can be um, really good at camouflaging themselves against mm -hmm. twigs and sticks and all that kind of stuff. They like to um, lay their egg cases in like this paper mache looking mm -hmm. thing. Um, actually bought a tree recently and it had one of these oh. egg cases okay. on it. So that was pretty cool. That's cool. And the egg case will have like up to 200 baby praying mantis in wow. there. Okay. And you won't even know that they've hatched. You can't tell the difference when it, when, um, you can't look at the egg case and tell if they've hatched or not. You just have to happen to see a baby praying <laughs> mantis somewhere. And that's how you know that you've had a hatch. Wow. So you can buy them on the internet and put them in a greenhouse or in a garden setting, but you won't know if they've hatched or not unless you just so happen to see the babies. And these mm. take five months to mature mm. and um, they can lay up to five egg cases in their lifetime. And they like to eat pretty much anything that will catch their attention. They're pretty slow moving. And um, yeah, so they'll grab anything, like another beneficial insect even, they'll grab, like bees and other praying mantis. So they're not real particular on what they eat. <laughs> wow. That's pretty tough. I've never seen a baby one, though. Have I haven't either, except uh -huh. like on the internet. Um, you can like look up okay. video of these things hatching out of their egg case. It's cool. really pretty cool. All right. It's pretty good stuff. Yeah. So once again, folks, be careful when you're using pesticides mm -hmm. in the garden, right? Because we do have beneficials out there that will help us. Mm -hmm. Right? That's right. Thank you much for that good information, Tony. We Thanks. appreciate that. So let's talk about blossom in rots. Of course, we <laughs> oh, hear that yeah. a lot when you're talking with, yeah, about watermelons, you yep. know, tomatoes. So what does that yep. mean? Yep, yep, we get it on squash, eggplants, even peppers. Uh, and the thing you hear about it most is uh, probably tomatoes, mm -hmm. you know, tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And that's where the blossom end, opposite the stem end, just rots. And it's all because that plant is not getting the calcium that it needs to form that tissue. And if mm -hmm. there's a lack of calcium, 
in the tissue of that plant to grow and develop that fruit. That's what it will manifest itself mm -hmm. is the rotting of that end of the fruit. And it could be because that there is adequate calcium in the soil and it's not being able to move into the plant because of a bad pH. The pH is not in the right range, right. which should be about 6.5 to 6.8 okay. for the calcium to have be available where it can be taken up. And if there's not uh, adequate water, That's right. water's a big thing. It's big. There could be plenty of calcium, the pH can be exactly right, and if the water is not consistent and uniform, you know, there will be times that there's not enough calcium because the nutrients move into plant by water. Mm -hmm. That's how they get in there. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the right water availability, that's how it's going to show itself. All right, Mr. D. Let's see if we can tackle some garden math. Gardening math. Yeah, yeah. I hate math. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all concur. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but math is a big part of, you know, putting down fertilizers, putting down pesticides. So you have to know a little math. That's right, kids. So when they told you to pay attention in the algebra class, you better you do did. that. You better, you got it. You're going to have to use yes, it. Yes, you're going to have to use it. Fortunately, we have calculators now that help. Mm -hmm. help and, and there are a few apps out there that, yes, that they are. give you a little bit of help, too. But you better... It's good to be able yeah, to yeah. know how to do it so you can kind of cross check and, right. and make sure you got it right. It's really important that you do it right. And, and you may want to, like I said, double check because one little decimal point mm -hmm. can make a big difference. <laughs> Two decimal points makes a real big difference. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, if you're supposed to get 10%, you know, 0.1 instead of, or 0.01, right. uh -huh. 0.1, you know, that, 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 that's very makes important. makes a difference, no doubt about that. Uh, but, you know, the important thing, uh, you know, when you're uh, a, a lot of the pesticides and fertilizers and soil test reports and mm -hmm. things like that will will break homeowners uh, information down to uh, a, a thousand square feet right. or exactly. sometimes per hundred square feet. Most of the time it's per thousand mm -hmm. square feet. So probably the most important thing you can do first is determine how many square feet that you're treating. And, you know, we all know that in order to find the area of a rectangle, you multiply the length times the width, and it'll give you the, the square in, in feet, and it'll give you right. the square feet. Or in inches, it'll give you the square inches. And um, if you have a, a lot, uh, I would determine the area of the lot first, and then I would determine the area of your house mm -hmm. and subtract that from your total square footage of your lot. Measure the, the uh, area of your driveway subtract that, me measure the area of your patio, subtract that, the area of your dog <laughs> pen, subtract that, the area of your swimming pool, subtract that, the area of your workshop, subtract that, and when, you, when you've done all of that, you will pretty much have the area, total area in square footage that you're treating. So then you'll know how much product to buy. And, and then when you... Uh, if you're using a fertilizer, uh, keep in mind uh, most of the soil test reports will tell you how much nitrogen you need per thousand square feet. They're not going to tell you how much triple 15 you need because you may not have triple 15. You may have triple 10 mm -hmm. or 61212 or 3400 mm -hmm. or there's a lot of different formulations of fertilizer. So they're going to tell you how much active ingredient you need uh, per thousand square feet. And then when you buy that product, whatever you come up with, you, if it, if it calls for, for 10 pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet, and you've got a 34% product, then you've got to break, you know, reduce the amount, of the, you're going to increase the total amount of the product you put out to get that 34%. You've got to bring it down to 34%. Yeah, Same way with a, you know, a 10%. Nitrogen, right. Triple 10 would be real easy. You know, mm -hmm. uh, if you if you would need to put 10 pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet, then then you're going to put uh, uh, if you have triple 10, be a hundred. I think a hundred pounds of triple 10 that you're going to have to put out there. That'd be two bags of fertilizer. Right. So uh, if it's a 50 pound bag, so so just double check everything. Use algebra, use your <laughs> algebraic expression. I have to write it down yes. and look at it. I mean, it if down. I try to do it in my head, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a mess. So write it down and then cross multiply, cross check, and then make sure you've got it right. Because you don't want to, 
you can you can add more. So if you underestimate, you can go back and you can add more. But it's pretty hard to take, take up yeah. if you put too much mm -hmm. out there. And putting too much out there with fertilizer can contaminate our water supplies, mm -hmm. and it can create problems. It can cre create al algae blooms and mm -hmm. things like that. Don't feel like just because you have a 50 pound bag of fertilizer, you've got to use it all. It right. will keep, it will keep. You can roll it up, put some duct tape on it and use it next year. <laughs> um, just use what you need. Uh, and with uh, herbicides, if you put out more than you're supposed to put out, uh, you can kill desirable, you know, grass. Some, some of the herbicides may be, you know, targeted to just broad leaves and, and, but if you, if you go way, 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 you know, more than you're supposed to, you can might kill everything that you, yeah, that you've got out there. For sure. Um, so it's important to, to follow label directions and unfortunately, you gotta use math. All right. Well, to, speaking to, of using math, you wanna get to our math problem? Well, let's do a, let's do a right. math problem, yeah. Let's, let's see if we can do one quickly. Okay. So set us up here, what do we have? Have I gotta show you my scratch in here on this? I can do that, I can do that. Uh, what I've got here is triple 15 fertilizer okay. and uh, the uh, soil test recommendation calls for 10 pounds per thousand square feet. So uh, I know that I have 4,000 square feet that I need to treat. Okay. Uh, I've, I've done all my subtractions and additions and multiplications and, and, and I've got a 4,000 square feet I need to treat. So I just set up an al algebraic expression uh, okay, 10 pounds per thousand square feet. I've got 4,000 square feet. So four times 10 is 40 pounds. I need 40 pounds of nitrogen okay. on my 4,000 square feet. And I'm using 15, triple 15. So it, triple 15 is 15% nitrogen, 15% phosphorus, and 15% potash. Correct. And so I've got a 15% material. So I set it up, you know, 40 pounds is 15% of what? 40 pounds is, it just happens to be 15% of 266.66. <laughs> so I need 266.66 pounds yeah. of triple 15 on that 4,000 4, square yeah. feet. See, it's a weak material. So hmm. the fit triple 15 is only, it's 45%. Now, now in that, you're also getting the same amount of potassium right. and the same amount of of, uh, of phosphate. Uh, so 15, triple, triple 15 is 45% fertilizer and 55% inert, inert ingredients. material, yeah. Yeah, as they say, and, uh, or ingredient. Uh, yeah. So that, there's a lot of fertilizer in there. But uh, so that, you know, I don't, 266 pounds, how many bags is that? That's, that's quite a bit of fertilizer. Yeah. I think they come in what 40, maybe 40, 50 pound bags. And, and 10 sure. pounds of nitrogen is is a lot of nitrogen. I just threw that out there. It may be a, probably one pound or th one to three pounds is probably more a more common recommendation on, on nitrogen fertilizer. Mm -hmm. So I just that was just an example that I used. So. Yeah. And of course we know nitrogen moves pretty quickly through the soil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Forward, and, and you know it's going to be there if it's not encapsulated, if it's not slow release form. Mm -hmm. That's it good point. will be gone in four to six weeks. Yeah. You know, a lot of rain, four weeks, yeah. six That's weeks. Good point. If there's not too much rain, in four to six weeks, it's gone. Yeah, algebra teacher would be proud of you, Mr. D. Thank no, you much. No, no. Trust, <laughs> trust me, she wouldn't. <laughs> well, we appreciate that math question for us, all right? Thank, thank you, you thanks. <laughs>
All right, here's our Q&A session. Tank, you help us out, we get in trouble, all right? Okay. Here's our first viewer email. I put a lot of coffee and tea grounds, grounds in my small compost pile. Does the caffeine from coffee grounds have any beneficial, neutral, or detrimental effects on plants or the compost organisms? My compost pile is also my fishing worm bed. Also, do my veggies accumulate caffeine in them? And this is from Mr. Dunn in Bartlett. What do you think about that, Tanya? That's an caffeine. excellent question. It is. But um, you have to know a little bit about hmm. soils and how plants take up uh, minerals from the soil. And it's all at a very microscopic level. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry about uh, your plants having extra caffeine in them. They're, they're not going to have a problem with that. Because your plant root hairs are taking up things you know, at elemental levels. So caffeine is not a compound that they're going to take up. They're okay. going to take up the different elements that used to be in the coffee grounds. And coffee and tea grounds are excellent uh, sources right. of nitrogen for your compost pile. Right. So definitely keep using them and uh, enjoy the benefits of those good, um, good source of greens, as we call it, in your compost pile. And you don't have to worry about any kind of negative, effect, negative effects from the caffeine. Oh. I have a theory, though, about the fishing worms. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes the fishing worms I try to put on the hook are more active than others. Oh, and personally, caffeine. I think they had a shot of caffeine. Oh, well, some of them, they're, so. they really wiggle a lot. Oh, right? boy. You know, so I, I don't know. We need the to check caffeine. that out. Huh. We need to study that. Yeah. <laughs> we need to look at that. <laughs> hmm. We can get a grant for research yeah, on fishing worms. Yeah, just to study that. But yeah. hmm. well, what about those, uh, you know, those uh, compost organisms that are in there, those microorganisms? Well, Do you think it would the caffeine would affect them I don't as, think as, so. as they're breaking yeah. down the, the compost? I don't think so. I haven't read anything about that anywhere. And I, all I've read is how great uh, coffee grounds and tea grounds are. So okay. I think you're okay. All right, so there you have it, Mr. Dunn. All right, here's our next viewer email, the picture. There is a rust-like coating or growth on some of our beans this year. What is it? And do we need to worry about it spreading throughout the patch? And this is Miss Sarah and Franklin. So rust-like coating on the beans. Mr. D, have you seen that before? Probably co rust. It's rust. Say. It's yeah. probably rust. rust. Yeah, yeah. Rust. it's a very, very common uh, fungal disease mm -hmm. that uh, attacks uh, uh, you know, snap beans and you know a lot of beans. Uh, there are uh, there's reddish brown pustules on the leaves and pods, and that's mm -hmm. pretty that's pretty it, clear. Yeah. Uh, there's fungicides that will uh, uh, do the trick. Chlorothalonil uh, and even sulfur will will take rust out. Uh, so uh, keep in mind with a the fungicide, they're preventative in in nature uh, primarily. So if you've already got the problem, you're not going to cure the problem that you've got. Mm -hmm. With chlorothalonil and sulfur, but you should prevent it from sh from spreading right. to uh, unaffected tissue. So, uh, you know, if you've got a problem with it right now, you might want to you might want to spray and then and then and then you know wait until till uh, you know seven to ten days mm -hmm. or something like that. And 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 you know the the rust is more of a problem. Uh, most fungal organisms like moist. Uh, uh, warm, moist conditions, and uh, if we have drier conditions and you know a lot of sunshine and all that, and you've got you know some air drainage, mm -hmm. uh, then that problem might go away. Right. Uh, if not, every seven to ten days, you know you can you can treat with a fungicide, but you do need to look at the label sure. and make sure check for pre-harvest intervals because if you're picking these snap beans, uh, you know make sure that that uh, uh, you know, if that's a seven day you know, waiting period after you've uh, sprayed, then you need to wait seven days before you pick them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does it affect the actual bean itself? As far as the organism? Yeah. It, yes, it is actually, you know, feeding on that pod. Okay. It's feeding on the pod. Now, will it hurt you if you eat that? Right. This is what I'm Probably getting Probably not. Okay. okay. As far as, I, you know, I'm not aware of any uh, uh, of rust being a problem for, you know, if you accidentally ingest one. Okay. There you have it, Miss Sarah. All right, here's our next viewer email. My squash has large leaves and yellow flowers. On my plants, when the squash flower falls off, the squash dies. What did I do wrong? And this is Miss Norma. So, Tanya, what happened? 
All right, well, that's a very common question, very especially common. at the mm -hmm. beginning of the growing season. Uh, squash actually have male flowers and female flowers. Mm -hmm. And so obviously the only flowers that can bear fruit are the female flowers. Right. So it just so happens that squash has a tendency to put male flowers on first. And obviously you've got to have female flowers and male flowers at the same time to get a squash, mm -hmm. a, a fruit. So probably what's happening, it's early in the, in the blooming season when, when this uh, person, when she noticed this, and um, you've got all male flowers and the male flowers, since they can't grow a fruit, they fall off and that's pretty much the end of it. And you can tell if you have a male flower or a female flower by looking at the, the base end of it, it's the little stem kind of part that attaches the flower to the stem. Mm -hmm. If it's kind of swollen um, from the get-go, then that is uh, the female ovary part of the right. plant. So hang on, you'll get, you'll get fruit <laughs> unless the squash vine borers get to them first. <laughs> but uh, yeah, oh, so. <laughs> but yes, you will eventually have both male and female at the same time blooming and get pollination and your female flowers will bear fruit and your male ones will just continue to fall off. All right, you got a small embryonic fruit. Yes. Yeah, that you see behind that's attached to the female flowers, what that is. Uh -huh. right. So bees actually help with the pollination, but what if you don't have any bees? How can you help? Well, you can get a Q-tip, ah. yeah, and uh, do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And explain that one to your neighbors, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. So there you have it, Miss Norma. All right. But Tanya, Mr. D, we're out of time. It's been fun. Thanks. All right, thanks. All right. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplots at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. If you'd like more information on beneficial insects or more garden math examples, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid South. Be safe. <laughs>